In accordance with Standing Order 43, the time for members' statements has concluded. Questions without notice. The member for Franklin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. This week, the Prime Minister told a 60-year-old aged care worker in Burnie to get a better job. Is he aware that 65-year-old aged care worker Elaine Smith from Devonport has told the, the advocate member for Franklin, the Prime we'll just, Minister is— We'll just resume a seat for a second. Members on my right will cease interjecting. The member for Franklin will begin her question again. I wish to hear the question. The member for Franklin, if you could start from the beginning, and the clock Thank will be you. reset. This week, the Prime Minister told a 60-year-old aged care worker in Burnie to get a better job. Is he aware that a 65-year-old aged care worker, Elaine Smith from Devonport, has told the Burnie advocate the Prime Minister is, quote, putting people down because they are doing a low-paid job, unquote? Is this why the Prime Minister and Senator Hanson teamed up to give aged care workers a tax cut of just $10 a week, but give themselves a tax cut of $7,000 every year? The Prime Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The 65-year-old uh, worker that uh, wrote to the Devonport paper would expect a member of parliament not to begin her question with a falsehood. She knows very well, very, very well, that what she said about me, what, I, what she claimed I said, is not true. Not true. It is the Labor Party that says if you're 60 on my left. and you're an aged care worker, you can't aspire to earn more, to a promotion, to get more training, to go from being a nurse to a manager or a personal care assistant to a nurse. That's the Labor Party, the party the honourable member is a member of that wants to keep those workers in their place. There used to be a time when the Labor Party stood up for workers. There used to be a time the when the Labor Party Isaacs was all about aspiration, when they weren't mystified by aspiration, when they believed in people getting ahead. And now we have a Labor Party that has voted against Australian workers keeping more of the money they earn. And they've described tax relief as a giveaway, Mr. Speaker. You know why? Because they think that every dollar Australians earn belongs to the government. So when you reduce tax, the government is giving money away. Well, let me advise the out-of-touch members opposite that Australians believe the money they earn is theirs. It's their hard-earned money. And what they want to do is be able to keep more the of member it. For Bruce and what we've warned. been able to achieve today is for them. This has been a win for hard-working Australian families who will be able to keep more of the money they earn, who will be given every encouragement to dream, to aspire, to have high hopes and know that when the they earn Sydney a bit more, they will only be paying 32 and a half cents in the dollar instead of going into higher and higher tax brackets. This is a massive personal income tax reform, the most comprehensive in a generation, and the winners are the hard-working Australian families the Labor Party has abandoned. The member for Franklin wishing to table a document. I seek leave to table Elaine's comments. Is leave granted? Leave is not granted. The member for Dunkley has the call. Yeah. Member for Dunkley has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Will the Prime Minister outline to the House how the government's tax relief plan will enable working Australians to keep more of their money, including in my electorate of Dunkley? Is the Prime Minister aware of alternative approaches that seek to increase taxes? The Prime Minister has thank the Thank you, call. Mr Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. Today we have seen a massive win for hard-working Australian families. They'll be able to keep more of the money they earn. It's their money. They earned it. And we should take no more of it than the government needs to to deliver the essential services Australians rely on. Because of the stronger economy that we are seeing right now, 
we have stronger government revenues, we can ena are enable to give tax relief to all Australians. We are able to guarantee essential services and infrastructure, defence capability, health and education, and the government can live within its means, coming back into balance a year earlier. Everything depends on that stronger economy and ensuring that Australians have the incentive to get ahead, to realise their dreams, to aspire and realise their aspirations. That is what the enterprise of our nation is all about. That is what drives Australia. And Mr Speaker, what has the Labor Party done? It sought to block this change, voted against us. It, it regards any tax relief as a giveaway because they think that everything Australians earn belongs to the government. Now, Mr Speaker, what our tax reform does is Member ensure that middle-income Australian, middle income Australians from this next financial year, starting in July 1, they will be receiving over four million of them $530 back in a tax offset. And many middle income families will be getting over $1,000 back. But then, over the full extent of the reform, we get to the point that 94 per cent of Australians will never pay more than. 32 and a half cents in the dollar uh, in every dollar, additional dollar they earn. And the Labor Party talks about fairness and a progressive tax system. Well, in 24-25, those on the top bracket, which by then will start at 200,000, will be paying a larger share of personal income tax receipts than they do today. Mr. Speaker, this is about aspiration. These are the values the coalition stands for, the Liberal and National Party stand for, values of aspiration. They used to be the values of the Labor Party, but they have been abandoned by a Labor Party that's walked out and given up on the men and women it was founded to represent. What an abandonment of asp aspiring Australians. What an abandonment of Australian workers. This has been a week of shame for the Labor Party, abandoning the people that they were founded to represent. Members on both sides, the Leader of the Opposition has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. How is it fair that the Prime Minister teamed up with Senator Hanson to give themselves a $7,000 tax cut Instead of supporting Labor's plan to give 10 million working Australians a tax cut of up Leader to 928 dollars Leader of the Opposition will pause. The member for McKellar is warned. The Leader of the Opposition will begin his question again. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. How is it fair that the Prime Minister teamed up with Senator Hanson to give themselves a $7,000 a year tax cut? Instead of supporting Labor's plan to give 10 million working Australians a tax cut every year of up to $928 a year, almost double the tax cut they're getting from the government, why won't the Prime Minister do more to help working Australians instead of helping himself to a $7,000 a year tax cut every year? The Prime Minister has the call. Well, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, a stronger economy enables more Australians to get a job. It enables more Australians to start businesses. It enables more Australians to earn higher wages. Everything depends on a stronger economy. And providing the right incentives to ensure that as Australians uh, work harder, work longer, for work Sydney in more skilled jobs, that, that everything they do is incentivised so they can get ahead and realise their dreams. This is what Labor used to be all about, and the abandonment by the Leader of the Opposition flies in the face not just of what Keating and Hawke and Rann and others said, but in fries flies in the face of what he himself said. I mean, this is a leader who said in his maiden speech, Mr Speaker, the old class war conflicts should finally be pronounced dead. <laughs> Hang on. Just check. Yes, that was that was the member for Maribyrnong, absolutely. The real conflict, he said, is between those who are stuck in a business-as-usual routine and those that pursue innovation, knowledge and creativity. 
They are the drivers of economic growth around the world. He said, what I want to work, accomplish for working people is about aspiration. Oh, hello. 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 Well, Members on my right. Can this be true? Can this be? Was there an, is there an impersonator? Is this the same leader of the opposition, the same member for Maribyrnong? Mr Speaker, everything the Labor Party stood for, was founded on, was about encouraging Australians to get ahead. Everything they were founded on. And they had, that was their ideal, and our values of enterprise, investment, innovation, that's what we stand for. And you know, in many years, many times, the aspirations of both sides of politics often coincided. But now we see this huge gulf. Labor, less investment, wherefore more investment. We're for a stronger economy, Labor's for a weaker economy. We're for lower taxes, Labor is for higher taxes. $70 billion more personal income tax. This is what this bloke is going to go to the election on. He's going to ask people to vote to pay $70 billion of more member personal Fenner, income tax. That's what he's going to ask the member to do. For is and he's going to do that as all his colleagues will, from the privileged position of a taxpayer-funded job here, treating with contempt the, the aspirations has of hard-working. The member for Capricornia. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer update the House on how the government's personal income tax plan will deliver tax relief to encourage and reward the aspiration of hard-working Australians? What are the consequences of not encouraging aspiration in this way? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for Capricornia for her question. She's part of a team, the Turnbull government, that is getting things done, Mr yeah. Speaker. More jobs, a stronger economy and, once again today, lower taxes. Turnbull government getting things done. $140 billion and more in tax relief for Australians out there working hard, paying tax. That is what has passed through the parliament today, and I thank the members in the Senate and the members in this House who have ensured that Australians who work hard are the winners today as a result of the tax relief plan that has passed this parliament. Some, a registered nurse on $75,000 a year will have an extra $530 in their pocket from the 2018-19 income year onward and $3,740 in their pocket over the first seven years of this plan, Mr Speaker. She's one of uh, 10 million Australians which begin uh, benefiting from that plan and around 60,000 in the members' own electorate in Capricornia. A workshop manager at $88,000 will have an extra 575 in their pocket from next income year and over $4,000 over the first seven years of that plan, Mr Speaker. Low and middle income earners are our first priority. Dealing with bracket creep moves from there and then ensuring at the end of our plan a simpler tax system where 94 per cent of Australians do not face a marginal tax rate any greater than 32 and a half cents in the dollar. That's a real plan. That's a real plan, dealing with real problems. It's a plan that recognises and rewards aspiration, Mr Speaker. It's a plan that understands that what Australians earn is their money. That is a fundamental difference between on those on this side of the House and the Labor Party. It is a plan that is not paid for by jacking up taxes on other Australians, Mr Speaker. The Labor Party want to put $200 billion more of tax on the Australian economy. And what we've learnt in this place today is they want to put an extra $70 billion on the Member personal Shortland income tax of Australians in this country over the next decade. So they will go to the next election and they say, vote Labor and pay $70 billion more in tax in personal income tax over the next 10 years. What we have delivered today is $140 billion of tax relief. It's a plan that's driven by the economics of opportunity, not the politics of envy of the Labor Party and the Leader of the Opposition. Today, they tried to cut the tax plan in half. They tried to take a $140 billion plan and turn it into a $70 billion plan. Well, thankfully for the workers of Australia, 
The workers of Australia had the Liberal and the National parties to stand up for them here in this place and support good tax policy based on a strong plan. And it's part of a plan for a stronger economy that is being delivered under the Turnbull government that those opposite could never, ever deliver. The member for Franklin. My question is to the Prime Minister. Why did the Prime Minister team up with One Nation to give themselves a tax cut instead of supporting Labor's plan to give the 39,000 people in Braddon who earn less than $125,000 a tax cut of up to $928 a year, almost double the tax cut they'll get from this government? Why won't the Prime Minister do more to help working Australians instead of telling them to get a better job and giving himself a tax cut? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The honourable member knows very well that Tasmania is enjoying stronger economic growth, and Tasmania, as Tasmanians are seeing Franklin stronger economic inject. growth, uh, lower uh, unemployment, and they're seeing better prospects than they've seen for many years. And that's a result of a strong economic plan from our government here in Canberra and from Will Hodgman's government in Hobart. And it is based on the hard work of Tasmanians who want to work hard, who want to invest, start businesses, they want to get ahead and realise their dreams and respect their aspirations and, may I say, regardless of their age. Everyone is entitled to have aspirations, to realise their dreams, to get a better wage, to start a business. Everyone is entitled to aspire to that. And the honourable member is disrespecting the aspirations and the opportunities of the people of Tasmania by standing in the way or attempting to stand in the way of our comprehensive personal income tax reform the member because for it, Lawler. as part of our economic plan, is ensuring that the people in her state are seeing better times ahead, and they're doing that because of aspiration. The very aspiration that mystifies her deputy leader is what is inspiring stronger economic growth in Tasmania, and it is what we are encouraging and enabling with our economic plan, with our income tax reform plan, with our reductions in company tax, with our investments in infrastructure. That is what is ensuring there are better times in Tasmania, and the members, the honourable member, would be well aware that the people of Braddon are keenly aware that, that the risk to their prosperity is the Labor Party and the, the Labor Party and its threat of higher taxes, fewer jobs, lower wages, less investment. The member for Indi has the call. Thank you. My question is to the Minister for Small and Family Business. M Minister for Small and Family Business. We know that red tape, inconsistent regulations and disparities across borders is severely limiting economic opportunity for businesses, particularly in my communities of Albury and Wodonga. And we did appreciate you bringing together your New South Wales and Victorian colleagues to Wodonga on the 12th of June, and I welcome the commitment to overcome border anomalies. Now my community is asking, when will we start seeing the results of these discussions and will you take a leadership role in holding the state governments to account to deliver on these commitments? The Minister for Small and Family Business. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank uh, the member for Indi for her question uh, her and her passion, along with the member for Farah, who, uh, who joined me on the day as well. Uh, for this very important issue of cross-border red tape and regulation. I also note in, uh, in cross-border form today we have up in the, uh, in the gallery the Wodonga Catholic School uh, from, uh, from the one side of the border and Scott School at Albury from the other side of the border. Uh, but, uh, the member for Indi on the 12th of June, you're right, we got together the Deputy Premier of New South Wales, John Barillaro, uh, and the Minister for Small and Family Business, Phil Daladakis. Uh, and we uh, agreed and signed an intent. We picked four areas that frustrate uh, the cross-border relationship. They were namely taxis, trade person licensing, heavy vehicle transport, RSA, the responsible service of alcohol and conduct of gambling. Uh, you've got the crazy situation. You know, a caravan manufacturer in Victoria, Jayco, 
can take three caravans on a truck to the border, has to take one off, carries two straight through New South Wales, and at the Queensland border can put three back on. You know, this is the sort of rubbish that we've got to overcome. Because I know it's, it's, it's obviously a, overwhelmingly apparent at the border towns, but the theory here is if we can get New South Wales and Victoria, you've got those two states where the benefits will flow across the entire states. And as my father always said, when you put those two states together, they spill more beer than the other states drink. So it's a very pragmatic and practical approach to try and overcome. Uh, the, the Deputy Premier of New South Wales has already done it with us in New South Wales and ACT and also in Queensland. Uh, so it's not a first. The Minister, Phil Daladakis, has taken away uh, a document that he will get the Premier to agree to. Uh, we will sign up a memorandum of understanding in the next couple of months, I'm told. But more importantly, that hasn't stopped the department starting to work on these areas that we've said. So, you know, it won't be long. I hope we're talking inside three months that we get the first deliverable. Uh, you know, I hope it's something like a, a taxi that picks up someone at Albury, drops them 15 minutes away in Wodonga, cannot legally pick someone up at Wodonga and take them back over the border. You know, it's that sort of lunacy that we're talking about. We had the mayors as well, so you're talking about three levels of government here. I've already having discussions with the small business minister for Tasmania and the new small business minister, Stefan Canole, in South Australia with a view to bolting them on. The idea here is COAG hasn't worked. Uh, historically, on, it's hard to get everyone to get together and come together. If we can come up with the two big states and then bolt others on over time, we can, we can do and deliver from day one. That's the hope and, and, and the great hope that we have. Deliverables within three months. Look forward to working with you and the member for Farrah uh, moving forward to make sure we can fix this problem for the whole economy. The member for Page. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister for Infrastructure and Transport. Will the Deputy Prime Minister update the House on how the government is securing a stronger and better future for all Australians, including those living in rural and regional Australia? And is the Deputy Prime Minister aware of any roadblocks to economic growth in our regions? The Deputy Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Page for his question. Mr. Speaker, jobs, jobs, and more jobs. This is the focus of the Liberal and Nationalist government. This is what we're doing. This is what we're delivering. Today, it's all about tax cuts. Tax cuts, relief for hard-working Australian families, a better deal for workers. You know, workers. They're the people that those opposite once purported to represent. Afraid they don't anymore. Afraid they don't anymore. But I welcome back the uh, member for Maramanong. When the tax cuts were being passed, he was lurking up the back there with the whip. We didn't see him. Very red-faced, very embarrassed. But I tell you what, the tax cuts have passed the House of Representatives, passed the Parliament. Thanks to the member for McEwen, passed today by this government, Angela Allen, a nurse at the Lismore Base Hospital in the uh, member for Pages electorate, will now pay less tax. She will. Registered nurses earning $75,000, just as many in the Page electorate do, will have an extra $530 in their pockets from the budget year onwards, with an extra $3,740 in their pocket over the first seven years of the tax plan. That's a lot of money. That's certainly a lot of money for them. We know that the key to more economic growth, the key to greater aspiration and the key to stronger regional <coughs> communities is jobs and tax cuts. It's not mystifying. It's not mystifying. It's aspirational. It's happening. The member's electorate has seen a jobs bonanza, thanks to the member for Page's hard work and the policies and the infrastructure investment by this government, by the Liberals, by the Nationals. In his electorate alone, a thousand jobs will be created thanks to the infrastructure rollout, the regional development investment. The member is part of a team which is delivering on our promise to create a million jobs in five years. But you know what? We've done it five months early. Five months early. A million jobs. And now today, tax cuts, tax relief for those hard workers, those people that this, that side of politics once said that they represented. Uh, now, the member for Page is part of a team which has delivered small business tax cuts to back local farmers, family businesses and locals having a go. And there's plenty of people having a go in the Northern Rivers. The member has been a champion of local infrastructure projects, such as the $3.44 billion for the Pacific Highway, $2 million for the Page Bridge upgrade and $2 million for Page Road, and 
$1.8 million for bridge replacements in the Clarence Valley and Kyogle. Now, as regional people know, when we build a bridge, Labor puts up a roadblock. When we, tax, uh, when, we, when we cut taxes for small businesses, Labor plans to hike them up, to jack them up. They do. But don't look too perplexed. That's exactly what you'll do, uh, Member for McMahon. And when we back aspiration, Labor sits there mystified, absolutely mystified. They can't work out why we're doing it, because we back workers, we back families, we back small businesses, and we'll keep doing it, and we'll keep doing it right now until Prime the next Minister's election and beyond. Concluded. Member for Griffith. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Why did the Prime Minister team up with One Nation to give themselves a tax cut instead of supporting Labor's plan to give the 63,000 people in Longman who earn less than $125,000 a tax cut of up to $928 a year, almost double the tax cut they'll get from the government? Why won't the Prime Minister do more to help working Australians instead of telling them to get a better job and giving himself and Senator Hanson a $7,000 tax the cut? The Member for Griffith yeah. will be. Sorry. The member for Griffith will begin her question. Well done, Thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. Why did the Prime Minister team up with One Nation to give themselves a tax cut instead of supporting Labor's plan to give the 63,000 people in Longman who earn less than $125,000 a tax cut of up to $928 a year, almost double the tax cut they'll get from the government? Why won't the Prime Minister do more to help working Australians instead of telling them to get a better job and giving himself and Senator Hanson a $7,000 tax cut? The Treasurer has to call. Mr Speaker, I thank the member for her question and the Prime Minister for allowing me to respond. People don't believe Labor on taxes. It's that simple. They make all sorts of promises. They make, they, the, the, the one I like the moment is that the Shadow Treasurer says he's going to put the deficit levy back on and he promises to take it away three years later. He really does. They promise to turn back boats. Yeah, sure you will. Sure you will. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. People do not, Australians do not believe Labor and the promises they make on tax. For the simple reason they know that every chance Labor gets, they will tax them more. And there's 270 billion proof points for that, Mr Speaker, in the tax policies they are taking to the next election. $70 billion in higher personal taxes as a result of the policy they announced this week and voted accordingly in the parliament this week. $45 billion. There's a $10 billion black hole on this, by the way, but around $5 billion a year on extra taxes on retirees. Higher taxes on small businesses, family businesses, higher taxes on the superannuation contributions, Mr. Speaker, including the catch-up contributions of women who have had children and are trying to make catch-up contributions on their superannuation. All higher taxes. Labor taxes more. It's tax on under Labor, Mr. Speaker, and it's tax off under the Liberals and the Nationals, Mr. Speaker. Tax on under Labor. Tax off under the Liberals, Mr. Speaker, because the, the Labor Party, too much tax is never enough for them. And there's a reason for that. There's a reason, and we all know it on this side. They cannot control their spending. It just goes up and up and up and up. And the only thing, the only thing is their taxes can never keep up with their spending. They come up with taxes that don't raise any money, don't they, the member for Lilly? He came up with a cracker. They're going to tax the mining industry at the top of the boom, send them into the ditch. That was his plan. Then the money doesn't turn up. But guess what? They spent the money. They spent all the money. You want to know how you get gross debt running at 30 per cent growth real time? That's what happened under the Labor Party. They can't control their spending. That's why they can't control their taxes. And when it comes to Labor and taxes, they are unbelievable. The member for Barara. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Revenue and Financial Services. Will the minister update the House on why it's important to have tax policies that reward aspiration? Is the minister aware of any threats posed by different approaches? The Minister for Revenue and Financial Services. 
I thank the member for his question. He is a true champion for his constituents, including his, new, his newest constituent, James. He, of course, wants Australians to keep more of their hard-earned income, and that is why this government has delivered an income tax plan to provide them with relief for all of those hard-working Australians. It's a plan that will see, of course, 94 per cent of Australians, including in his electorate of Barara, pay no more than 32 and a half cents in the dollar once our tan plan has been completed. Now, unlike those sitting opposite, we, of course, understand aspiration. It is not mystifying for us, but it appears that aspiration is not the only thing that mystifies the Leader of the Opposition and his Deputy Leader and those opposite. They're terribly mystified by this expression, the top end of town. You see, the Leader of the Opposition says that his mega retiree tax it will hit the top end of town. But let's just examine that for a moment. Beryl, a 64-year-old retiree from Devonport in Braddon, who earns a very modest $19,000, including $900 in franking credits, under their mega retiree tax, she will lose not just $1, not just two, but every single dollar, all $900 she will lose. It will mean that Graham, a part pensioner in Caboolture in Longman, would see his self-managed superannuation fund, which receives $5,300 in franking credits, under their mega retiree tax, they would lose $5,300. So let me just demystify it for the leader Member of the Shortland. opposition. These people, they are not millionaires. They are not the top end of town. Yet, under Labor's tax grab, under their plan, a high-flying CEO earning millions of dollars per year with a share portfolio of around 50 times the size of Beryl's and franking credits around 10 times the size of Graham's, how much under their mega retiree tax will they lose? Absolutely nothing. Justin Key, Susan Lamb and the Labor Party and the Leader of the Opposition, they have turned their backs on retirees. Brett Whiteley, Trevor Ruthenberg and the rest of the coalition team, we will stand up. We will stand up for retirees and we will stand up for pensioners for because we believe in aspiration. We believe in making sure that the people who work hard are rewarded for that hard work and enterprise, and we stand for fairness and equity, unlike those frauds opposite. We on this side of the chamber stand for lower taxes. You stand for higher taxes and can't be trusted. Just before I call the member for McMahon, the member for Shortland, I've warned and asked to cease interjecting. I haven't ejected anyone under 94A. He seems worried about it. Now, you don't have to pack up. Just stop interjecting. <laughs> Certainly a guilty plea. The member for McMahon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. By the time they're fully implemented, stage three of the government's personal income tax scheme and its big business tax cut will cost the budget at least $25 billion each and every year. How is it fair that the government is giving $25 billion every single year to business and the top 20 per cent of income earners while it's cutting billions from schools and from hospitals? The Prime Minister has the Mr. Call. Speaker, the government is spending more on schools and on hospitals every year. That one of Labor's great falsehoods is that the government is cutting spending on hospitals, for example, and they've been uh, driving a bus around uh, uh, around uh, Longman. Uh, is it a bus or a truck? A large vehicle with a large sign saying that we're cutting spending on the Caboolture Hospital. The reality is, the reality is that the funding to the Metro North Hospital Network in Longman is at record levels from the Commonwealth Government. Oh, yes, it is. Yep, it is. Absolutely. Funding is higher than ever. Why can we do that? Because we have a strong economy. Without that strong economy, you can't put one life-saving drug onto the PBS the way the Minister for Health does. Labor stopped doing that. They were running out of money because of a weaker economy, a stronger economy. 
enables governments to deliver the essential services that Australians need. So not only will Labor be going to the next election and asking Australians to vote for $70 billion more personal income tax to be paid by them to the government because they pose such a threat to the Australian economy and such a threat to Australian jobs. They pose a threat to the essential services that are receiving increased funding under our government. The stronger economy we promised in 2016, the jobs and growth we promised in 2016 is being delivered. We said we would ensure that Australians, hard-working Australian families could keep more of the money they earn, and the Senate has today passed the legislation that enables them to do precisely that. That is our commitment. We're backing Australian families. We're backing their aspiration. We're not mystified by it as the Labor, as the Labor Party is today. We understand that Australians want to be able to realise their dreams. They want to be able to get ahead. They want to be able to aspire to a higher, higher wages, to start a business, for their business to do better. They want to be able to realise their dreams. Labor stands in the way. It is contemptuous of the people it was founded to represent. This apparatchik class has abandoned the workers utterly. The member for Benelong. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Home Affairs. Will the Minister outline what steps the government has taken to protect Australian families from dangerous non-citizens, including criminal gang members? Is the Minister aware of any alternative views that would undermine this success? The Minister has the call. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the honourable member for his question. Uh, I pay great uh, credit and tribute to, uh, to the Prime Minister, the Treasurer, the uh, Finance Minister today for getting through a massive win for families. Yeah. This government is not only, Mr. Speaker, about helping families in a financial way, making sure that they've got more of their own money in their own pocket, but we're also about making sure that we can keep families safe. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the government has been unapologetic about making sure that we can secure our borders, because if we secure our borders, we can have a safe society, Mr Speaker. But we haven't stopped there. We've cancelled the visas of criminals, so non-citizens who are here in our country committing offences against women, against children, against Australian citizens otherwise. And we've cancelled more, Mr Speaker, we've cancelled more visas of criminals in the last 12 months than Labor cancelled in six years. And, Mr Speaker, we've cancelled a record number, over 250 visas of people that have committed sexual offences against children. We have cancelled, importantly, the visas of 184 outlaw motorcycle gang members. And the reason, Mr Speaker, is that the outlaw motorcycle gang members are the biggest importers and distributors of ice and amphetamine in our country. In country towns, in rural communities, in our capital cities, ICE is a scourge. And we are doing our very best to make sure that those families can grow up intact, that their children aren't lost to the perils of drug use, and we are stamping out outlaw motorcycle gang members. Unfortunately, Mr Speaker, we do know that outlaw motorcycle gang members have very clear links, links to other media to other mafia type organisations I'm sorry other mafia organisations uh, such as none of these up here Mr Speaker well one or two one or two actually three or four now that I look but Mr Speaker Mr Speaker the outlaw motorcycle gangs have specific links into our old friends at the CFMEU now the CFMEU also have their own tentacles into him, into her, Member into Barker. him, him, her, her, him, him. The CFMEU, Mr Speaker, owns and operates the modern Labor Party. Bob Hawke had the leadership and the guts to disaffiliate the Labor Party from the BLF. This leader of the opposition embraces, embraces the unlawful conduct of the CFMEU. And the fact is, Mr Speaker, you can't trust this leader of the opposition. You can't trust the Leader of the Opposition and you can't afford 
the Labor Party, Mr. Speaker. That's the reality, and the Australian public understand the this minister's man. time has concluded. The member for Macquarie can. I'm a Victorian, so don't take it personally, but you can remove the scarf for a start. Both can. They both, they both removed it. And I, I've got to say I didn't notice from this distance uh, earlier on. The member for Macquarie can ask her question. Mm -hmm. I'm Herbert. No, sorry, for member Herbert. For Herbert. Yes, being a Queenslander. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. How is it fair that this Prime Minister teamed up with One Nation to give themselves a $7,000 tax cut, is giving a nurse at Caboolture a tax cut of only $10 a week, and is cutting $2.9 million from Caboolture Hospital at the same time? Just how arrogant and out of touch are this Prime Minister's policies? The thank Prime thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the claim the honourable member made about Caboolture Hospital is completely false. Absolutely false. It is another one of those labour lies that are being peddled around Longman, showing, and it says it says a lot about the character of the Labor Party that it is prepared to tell such lies when, as I described a moment ago, funding for public hospitals in Queensland from the Commonwealth is increasing every year, and in particular to the metro north part of Brisbane, which is where Caboolture uh, it, the hospital is to be found. Under Labor's alternative proposal on tax, this is what would happen. A Queensland police sergeant would pay in 24-25 $1,253 more tax under Labor. A New South Wales senior school teacher would pay $1,800 more tax warned. under Labor. The a member minor, for Sydney has coal been minor working for BHP. Where's the member? There he is, down member for Hunter. Uh, would be paying $4,061 more tax. South Australian police superintendent would be paying more tax under Labor, $6,204. And Mr. Speaker, what we're talking about, a school nurse. The honourable member asked about nurses. A school nurse uh, in Victoria. Uh, would be paying $2,840 more tax under Labor. Now that is that is the difference. That is the difference. Labor has abandoned hard-working middle Australia. It just seeks to describe people with the occupations I've described as the top end of town or millionaires. These are hard-working Australians who are, are aspiring to get ahead. And over time, Labor wants them to move into higher and higher tax brackets so that more of the money they earn and they've earned through their hard work will go to the government. Well, we say we respect them, we respect their aspiration, we're not mystified by it, we want them to get ahead and we want them to keep more of the money those hard working families earn. The member for Brisbane. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Small and Family Business, the Workplace and Deregulation. Will the Minister update the House on how the government's income tax relief will benefit small business, both in Brisbane and around Queensland? And can the Minister tell the House what are the risks to small business from less aspirational proposals? Mr. Fire. The Minister for Small and Family Business. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for Brisbane for his question. And I hope sincerely he's not the solo Trev from Brisbane uh, and Queensland that we have in this chamber in the not too distant future. Uh, and I do thank him on a day, on a great uh, day for the taxpayers in his electorate. And I note that, for example, a plumber earning $72,000, Mr. Speaker, will uh, save $530 a year. You hear, and I congratulate the Treasurer and the Prime Minister and the Minister for Finance on the carriage of, of, the, pa of the passage of the tax cuts. Uh, it is the latest in our plan, and, and at the end of it, you have uh, hopefully great more, uh, a great deal more money spent back in small and family businesses. Uh, the secret—you hear the headline numbers all the time—the million jobs, 
420-odd thousand in the last 12 months, most ever, 80% uh, of them full-time. But the engine room of that is small and family business, yeah, around 65 per cent of the private sector employed in there. Uh, and what you've had since the election of a coalition government in 2013 is a net increase of 150,000 small and family businesses, an increase of uh, businesses opening their doors and employing people. That's how you get the result. What was the comparable? In the last year of the Rudd-Gillard Rudd government, uh, 61,000 small and family businesses closed. That's the comparison that you've got here. That's why the plan that the Treasurer and the Prime Minister are implementing is so important. That's how you get the results, Mr Speaker. Uh, I do note that today, and we often forget about unincorporated small businesses, small and family businesses, but 350,000, Mr Speaker, along with 2.5 million people uh, as wage earners in Queensland, will today benefit from this decision as of next year. And that gets overlooked a lot, because those businesses too, Mr Speaker, employ a vast number of people. Uh, but what will happen with more money in their pockets? And this is the key. This side of the House, we believe that businesses that earn profits and wage earners that earn their wage are the people best placed to decide how to spend it. And what will wage earners do with more money in their pocket? It's shown over half of them when surveyed said they will spend it back in the local economies. And what do the small businesses do? On average, they spend, of every local dollar spent in them, they spend themselves 42 cents of that back in the local economy. What's the threat? What's the alternative, Mr Speaker? It is tax as far as the eye can see. Insert name of tax here and the Labor Party and the Leader of the Opposition will increase it, be it employees, be it on businesses, be it on retirees, uh, be it on anyone that wants to get ahead, anyone that's aspirational. They will find a way they will find a way to stop it, along with, of course, their secret deals with their union mates. We must, for the sake of the country, the economy, the results that have been achieved, continue to deliver for those small and family businesses out there, not just in Brisbane, Australia-wide. Yeah. The member for Batman. Yeah. My question is to the Prime Minister. Can the Prime Minister confirm that he teamed up with One Nation to vote for a tax scheme that will mean a surgeon on $200,000 will get a tax cut 16 times larger than a nurse on $40,000, yeah. despite having a salary only five times larger. How is that fair? Or is the Prime Minister telling nurses to just get a better job too? The Treasurer has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I thank the Prime Minister for the opportunity to respond. The member for Batman is well known for saying that tax is not a burden. Apparently, tax is something that people love. I think it's fantastic. Tax is a burden on Australians who work hard because it's their money. It's their money, and we think the they should for keep as much of it as possible. As much as possible. But what the member for Batman and the Labor Party don't understand is that the more you earn, the more tax you pay. And I can tell you that over, over the period over the period of the tax plan that we have had passed through the parliament today, someone earning $200,000 will pay $458,809. That's what they would have paid. And they will have relief amounting to 2.5% reduction on them. 2.5% reduction. If you are earning $50,000 over that same period of time, you will pay $56,000 in tax and you will get a 6.3 per cent reduction in your tax. So more than twice the reduction in tax for those on low income earners and those on higher income, which the member for Batman and others on that side like to demonise, those on the highest tax bracket pay 30 per cent of the tax in this country. 30 per cent of the tax, and they represent 4 per cent of the taxpayers in this country. And at the end of the tax plan, they will account for 36 per cent of the tax pay. Now, what the Labor Party doesn't understand is you always run out of other people's money when you keep taxing them more and more and more and more. What our plan does is fair. What our plan does is understand that all Australians who work and pay tax work hard. Not some more than others, they all work hard. And they all deserve tax relief because that's how you create a stronger economy. Our plan is not based on creating winners and losers and pitting them against each other. 
what the Labor Party's plan is, Member is trying Gordon. to whack some with tax and try to con others that they're trying to cut their tax when every time they try and buy an investment property, because one in five police officers do, thousands of nurses, thousands of teachers, you're going to whack tax up on them. Thank Retirees who have done nothing more than buy shares in an Australian company, you're going to put $5 billion tax on them. Small businesses greater than $2 million in turnover, you're going to whack taxes up on them as well. People who are making contributions to their super, you're going to put more tax on them. $200 billion in a tax avalanche coming from the Labor Party on the Australian economy. And they laugh, Mr Speaker. They laugh and they giggle. They laugh and they giggle about tax, Mr Speaker, because they think tax is a privilege. It's a burden on Australians, and under this government, we're reducing that burden, and Labor wants to increase it. The member for Murray. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Health. Will the Minister outline to the House how a stronger economy enables the government to deliver the essential health services Australians rely on, and supports research into finding a cure for MND? as well as life-saving research into conditions such as spinal muscular atrophy. Is the Minister aware of any other approaches? The Minister for Health has the call. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And I want to thank the member for Murray for his question. Uh, only this morning he voted, along with every member on this side of the House, for tax cuts for 53,700 members of his electorate from 1 July. And you can only do that, you can only provide that tax relief if there's a strong economy. And that's the same thing which also allows a government to guarantee essential services, such as record funding for Medicare, record funding for hospitals, and record funding for medical research. Today is, of course, Global Motor Neurone Day. And importantly, I was able to join very recently at the MCG the great Neil Danaher, a friend, a close personal friend of the member for Murray's, uh, at the big freeze as part of the fight to end MND. On that day, we were able to contribute $2 million of matching funding to the work of the public to support them. One of the trials which that funding has supported is the Tecfidera trial. Elizabeth uh, from Seven Hills, I believe, in the member for Greenway's electorate, is on that trial. And what she has said about that research is, being part of this trial gives me hope. It is important for me because it gives me the chance to go on. And along with what we've been able to do with Mackenzie's mission for spinal muscular atrophy, with the listing of Spinraza for spinal muscular atrophy, that's the reason why every one of us is in this place. Because you, you can have a stronger economy and you can deliver results such as new trials and new research and new medicines, then that will make a difference to people's lives. And our guarantee is that every medicine which is supported by the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, we will list. We will list that. But you can only do that, of course, if there is a strong economy. And I'm asked if there's any alternatives. And I went, I went to the 2011 budget papers. Because in 2011, Labor deferred seven fundamental the drafts. The minister will resume his seat. The minister will resume his seat. The minister will resume his seat. Members on both sides. The member for Deakin is warned. The manager of opposition business on a port of order. Mr. Speaker, for a long time there have been issues in this house that are viewed as above politics. Issues like motor neurone disease have always been one of them. To turn this into a partisan partisan attack is not going to help the dignity of this house, and is not going to help in any way principles that have held in question time for a very long time. I haven't called the minister yet. I've heard from the manager of opposition business. I call the minister. And page 121 of the portfolio budget statement said in relation to seven medicines. Given the current fiscal environment, the listing of some medicines would be deferred until fiscal circumstances permit. 
until fiscal circumstances permit. Well, our guarantee is that as long as we are the in government, the minister will resume his seat. The manager of opposition business has the call. The manager of opposition business has the call. I move that the member be no longer heard. Yeah. <coughs> Question is that the member be no further heard. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. Order the question is the Minister for Health be no further heard. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint the honourable members for Lawler and Morton tell us for the ayes, and the honourable members for Capricornia and Gray tell us for the noes.
Order the result of the division is ayes 61, no 75. The question is therefore negative, and I'll just allow time for people to get back into their seats. I need to rush. Just wait till everyone takes their seats before we resume. Minister for Health. Mr Speaker, if you can't manage the economy, you can't manage health. And Labor will never be able to manage the economy. The member for Rankin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. By the time they are fully implemented, stage three of the government's personal income tax scheme and its big business handout will cost the budget at least $25 billion a year. Why is the government giving $25 billion every single year to big business and the top 20 per cent of income earners when gross debt has already reached a record half a trillion dollars under this Prime Minister? The Prime Minister has the call. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As the honourable member knows, uh, net debt is peaking this financial year as a share of GDP. And and, and, it is, and we have turned the corner on the debt that the Labor Party left us with. And we are backing hard-working Australian families to keep more of the money they've earned. We believe in the aspirations of hard-working Australian families. We want them to realise their dreams. We want them to be able to get ahead. We want them to be able to aspire to do all the things that a strong economy enables. Labor is standing in the way. Labor talks about health but undermines the strong economy that enables us to pay for it. The member for Moore. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment. Will the minister update the House on how the government's strong economic plan is creating more and better paying jobs for Australians? And is the minister aware of any plans that may jeopardise this jobs growth? Great the Minister for Trade and Investment. Oh, well, thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for more for his question. I know when I had the opportunity to visit more uh, not that long ago, and the uh, member and I had the chance to speak to a number of people in his electorate. Uh, one of them was, in fact, a cafe worker at Hillary's Harbour and more. Now, a cafe worker under the coalition now who's earning, say, 
$45,000 a year will be $440 a year better off as a result of the Coalition's tax cuts. That's the difference between the Coalition's comprehensive tax plan and the Australian Labor Party, which has a plan to impose an extra $70 billion of personal income taxes on Australians. But the fact is that this is all part of the Coalition's ongoing commitment to putting Australia in a more robust position. It's through tax cuts that we're providing so Australians can keep more of the money that they work for, so that they can keep more of the pay that they get, and they have more aspiration and incentive to earn even more. And it's also about this week the fact that we have been able to boost new export opportunities for Australian business as well with the launch of yet another trade agreement under this coalition's most ambitious trade agenda that Australia has ever seen. But I think we've got them a little bit rattled on the other side. But as you can see, the criticism about them being a long way away from the former Labor Party probably meant the Leader of the Opposition had to pull together the Brains Trust to come up with a new plan to have some kind of throwback to Labor. You can see the Leader of the Opposition would have been there. The Shadow Treasurer would have come in his best grey suit. Uh, they probably got the member for Rankin to come in, the Brains Trust, to help deliver the four years of surplus. And he said, we need to channel old Labor. How do we channel old Labor? And so they came up with a strategy. We know what worked for a former leader of the opposition. Let's channel a bit of Kim Beasley, they would have said. Let's go back with a tax rollback plan. So that's what we've got from Labor. We've got their big new tax rollback plan, channeling all the best bits of Kim Beasley. They're going to take it to the Australian people. The Australian Labor Party's going to roll back their tax cuts. The Australian Labor Party's going to roll back the strong border protection we've got. The simple fact is this. This leader of the opposition, Mr Speaker, has all the hallmarks of a populist except for popularity. And it's only the coalition who's going to be able to ensure that Australians enjoy more tax cuts in the future, that we manage the budget, that we open more export opportunities and, most importantly, that we continue to provide the right business conditions to drive a million new jobs for Australians, the vast bulk of which are full-time jobs and a more aspirational future. The Prime Thank you, Mr Speaker. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper.